Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, a case study for immunotherapies and targeted therapies. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of Lab Roots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots, the leading scientific social network site and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. For more information, please visit www.labroots.com. We do have a few announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the Q&A button lower left. We'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Louise Perkins. Dr. Perkins joined the Melanoma Research Alliance as Chief Science Officer in 2013, where she is responsible for the development and implementation of the MRA's scientific strategy to eliminate suffering and death due to melanoma. Her interests center on translational research, including genomics, drug discovery, and advancement of novel therapeutic approaches. Prior to joining the MRA, she was Chief Scientific Officer at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation for five years, following a 16-year research career at two major pharmaceutical companies. For more information on Dr. Perkins' experience, please click on her name. I will now turn it over to Dr. Perkins for her presentation. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Brenda said, I'm Louise Perkins. I'm the Chief Science Officer at the Melanoma Research Alliance. It's my pleasure today to give you this overview of melanoma, which really is a case study for immunotherapies and targeted therapies. Before we get started, I wanted to just spend a few minutes providing you a short introduction to the Melanoma Research Alliance itself, which really helps to set the context for the approach from which I'm coming to today's presentation. The Melanoma Research Alliance, or MRA, was founded in 2007 with the generous support of Deborah Black and Leon Black. We were established under the auspices of the Milken Institute, which is a philanthropic think tank that has really helped to launch our startup in a very fast way. As Brenda mentioned, our mission is to accelerate the pace of scientific discovery to eliminate melanoma suffering and death. We are the largest private funder of melanoma research and have been able to invest nearly $68 million in the research since our first grant went out of the door in 2008. In this coming grant cycle, we expect to award an additional $10 million to support the research. Our focus is on translational research. We have a particular emphasis on teams, as well as early career individuals and other individual investigators. And about 85% of our funding is focused on treatment-related melanoma research with the remainder in uh, prevention and early diagnostic studies. Now moving on into the body of the presentation, uh, the agenda is shown here and you'll see me come back to this from time to time as we go through just to orient us during the presentation. I wanted to just give a quick overview of the biology of melanoma and how melanomas form. I wanted to spend then some time on both the separate subjects of targeted therapy for melanoma as well as immunotherapy and at the very end, just wrap up with some brief commentary on the future directions in the disease. So now to move into the melanoma overview. Um, melanoma, as you may or may not know, is the deadliest of the skin cancers. And un unlike a lot of cancers, incidence is rising in the US. The median diagnosis for melanoma is at age 62. However, and a little bit startlingly, startlingly it is the most common cancer in 25 to 29 year olds. Um, it is well managed if caught early, and that's why there's a lot of emphasis on prevention and detection related activities early. However, if it is detected later in the disease, there is a very poor five year survival of about 15% if detected in stage four. I think what you can see in the graph on the right hand side of the screen is that while cases have risen, deaths remain flat 
but I think what we will see through the course of this presentation is with the advent of new therapies, um, I hope um, and anticipate that, that um, the arc of that death curve will in, in fact start to turn downwards. A little bit more about who gets melanoma. Uh, it, it does have its highest incidence in fair-skinned individuals. Um, you can actually see in the top of this chart that in um, the white races, um, there is a bit more melanoma in males than in females, which is not well understood. Um, but there is a, a low but detectable rate of melanomas in folks with uh, darker complexions, as you can see here on this graph. And they tend to get a different kind of melanoma uh, on different surfaces um, that have melanocytes in them, and I'll talk about that momentarily. Um, me cutaneous melanoma is depicted here in a variety of clinical images taken from an excellent review by Jennifer Lowe and David Fisher. Uh, you can see that um, melanoma has different presentations. It can occur in different parts of the body. Um, and the top left, uh, a typical superficial spreading melanoma is shown, an amelanotic melanoma in the top middle, uh, a nodular melanoma on the top right. And then some of the ones that tend to be more common in uh, folks that have a darker complexion, on the lower left, the acral lentiginous melanoma is one. Um, acral melanomas occur on the palms of the hands, soles of the feet, and under the fingernails. Um, they, they occur kind of at a steady rate in um, people of all complexions, as do ocular melanomas, also known as uveal melanomas, which are shown in this look into the eye on the lower right. So the bottom line here is, uh, well, more common in fair-skinned individuals, melanoma can occur in anyone, and uh, vigilance is extremely important. The next slide um, I won't go, I won't spend a lot of time on because it is very detailed. I do encourage you to take a look at the publication in Nature, um, which is an excellent, provides an excellent overview of how melanomas form. But suffice to say, as shown in the, the top center of this illustration, melanoma starts in the melanin producing, the pigment producing cells of the skin, known as the melanocytes. And um, when it occurs, it occurs in a relatively small lesion and then can progress and grow more deeply, as you can see in the march from stage zero to stage four, left to right on your screen. Um, of course, the, the deeper the melanoma, the bigger the melanoma, the more aggressive it tends to be and the poorer the outcome for patients. So it's, again, em really emphasizing a prevention, but in particular, early detection. Uh, as an important part of preventing the formation of bad melanomas. Well, where do melanomas come from? Uh, what we know from the genomics that has been done, that is sequencing of melanoma tumors compared to the normal uh, tissue of individuals who have provided those samples, is that, as you can see on the far right here, melanoma has the highest mutation rate of any human cancer. And um, melanoma, you know, that's a, um, not necessarily the most noble distinction for it to have, but it's 10 to 100 times um, more likely to have mutations than your run-of-the-mill human cancer. If you look at the lower right of this screen, you can see that big block of yellow there, which indicates the kinds of mutations that are prevalent in melanoma, the so-called C to T transitions. These are a fingerprint of UV exposure. And so if, um, as you can see, then there is a, a huge amount of evidence for UV-induced damage in melanoma, hence the reasons for sun-safe practices um, to decrease this incidence of mutation. But these uh, mutations actually um, aren't just, while there are a lot of kind of willy-nilly mutations present in melanoma, there are also some hallmarks of melanoma which provide um, a toehold for targets in treating the disease. And this um, illustration shows the results of summarizing the topmost hits come from whole exome sequencing, WES, of 213 melanomas. And in this analysis, consistent with what has been seen in other analyses, as shown in the top left, about 40%, sometimes people say 50%, it does vary from study to study, about 40% of melanomas harbored what are activating mutations in BRAF. Mutations in the signaling protein known as BRAF that actually turns on its function and renders normal control of the protein disabled. These mutations are quite commonly um, changes in the valine to agglutamine V600E, 
that's the V600E mutation. Those are the most common, but there are a handful of other mutations that can be discerned as you sequence more deeply in melanomas. The rest of the mutations, where red here are activating mutations and blue are um, inactivating mutations and the proteins that are indicated, the genes that are indicated, um, show that RAS mutations are very common. Um, in particular, NRAS seems to be the target for activating mutations in melanoma. And other pathways that impinge RAS signaling, including the GTPase activating protein NF1, that is inactivated, inactivated in melanoma, leading to a turn on of RAS signaling. Uh, other mutations that are prevalent are um, things that are involved in other tumor suppressors, such as P53, shown here as TP53, and P10, and then um, activating mutations in the cyclin CDK um, axis, uh, illustrated here by the CD CDKN2A mutation. So um, some of these mutations, as you might well think, then lead one to suggest, well, can we interfere with the function of these proteins? And that's really summarized here in the biology. Uh, with the prevalence of BRAF and RAS pathway mutations, it suggests that in certain melanomas, especially those with activating mutations in these pathways, that a personalized medicine approach targeting those molecules or signaling molecules downstream, such as MEK or ERK, and ERK is sometimes also known as MAP kinase or MAP-K, that uh, that kind of personalized medicine approach might really offer benefit for patients. In addition, it's reasonable to think and seems to be playing out that taking advantage of an anti-tumor immune response in melanoma against this wide array of newly formed antigens, so-called neoantigens, that arise from the mutations that are so common in melanoma, is it possible to take advantage of those to uh, either upregulate or stimulate a pre-existing immune response? And, uh, and you'll see that that seems to be uh, supported by the early biology and may indeed be playing out with the newer treatment tools that are available. So now let's move on to the targeted therapy approach in melanoma. I've already mentioned the ras mec erc pathway, which is um, shown here um, in this slide. Um, going from top to bottom, you can see that the, um, the RAS, RAS is really the topmost signaling molecule in this pathway. And then it signals through RAF and on into uh, MEC and then down into ERK. Um, there are molecules that have been developed to, to target each of these parts of this signaling pathway. And this includes um, vemurafenib, um, dibrafenib to target BRAF, trametinib and now cobimetinib to um, target MEC, and then newer agents that are being explored in the pipeline that are aimed at the ERK part of the, of the pathway. Um, there are, and in fact have been, uh, in a number of regulatory approvals, both in the U.S. and, uh, and abroad, uh, vemurafenib, dibrafenib, trametinib, the combination of dibrafenib and trametinib, as well as, and these are all approved in the U.S., as well as the combination of vemurafenib and cobimetinib, which was approved in Switzerland, and I think we can reasonably expect that it will gain approvals elsewhere in the world in the near future. So these are all um, agents that seem to work to disrupt signaling down this pathway that occurs due to the dysregulated mutational status of these in these tumors. So let me talk for a little bit now about how targeted therapy agents act when they're applied as individual drugs, as single agents. So vemurafenib and dibrafenib, um, like other agents that are targeted at this particular pathway, require a diagnostic test to detect the presence of V600 mutations. And in fact, in the US are approved only for the treatment of the V600E melanomas. Um, in addition, the, what one sees when you use these drugs in patients who have really pretty significant metastatic burden that there is a, um, a strong response rate, about 50% response rate. And um, the individuals in the review at the bottom ha use the expression dramatic to describe the kinds of responses that are seen. I think you, you probably can appreciate that oncologists are not the most um, outspoken bunch. They're not the most effusive bunch. But it really is true. Patients, I can think of one young woman in particular who had um, essentially been placed in hospice, was found to have um, been eligible for treatment with 
um, these agents, and she really went, did undergo one of these dramatic responses, uh, essentially being well enough to be up and around and attending things. Um, and so these drugs can really be a miracle for some patients. The uh, side effects are uh, manageable. They do include kind of the activation of uh, other cancers. There are other side effects associated with these and of course with all of these drugs. But uh, I would say in general, they're not what you think of as your typical chemotherapy side effects. Um, another approach beyond targeting BRAF is to use the MEK inhibitor, trametinib. Because it's a little bit downstream of BRAF, it sweeps in another uh, mutated isoform of BRAF, the V600K mutation. And, but it too requires a diagnostic test to be used um, per the label in the US. Uh, as I hinted at, there is a paradoxical activation of signaling uh, down this pathway in response to treatment with these agents, unfortunately. It's common. Um, it may relate to some of the side effects, and uh, nearly all patients uh, experience progression and resistance to these agents in uh, one to two years, which um, means that uh, there's more to be done. And one approach that folks have taken to be able to try to improve on these agents is to use them in combination. So BRAF MEK inhibitor combinations were developed to overcome the limitations of the single agent therapies. They do have a better response rate when used in combination. Um, they do come with their own side effects, but interestingly, some of the side effects seem to be mitigated by using the drugs in combination. Um, the combinations that have been tested have in fact been tested compared to single agents. And um, so there's data that shows that dabrafenib and trametinib, um, summarized as D plus T, is superior to vemurafenib alone. Likewise, in a separate clinical study, it was shown to be superior to dabrafenib alone. And um, in another study, the combination of vemurafenib and the MEK inhibitor, cobimetinib, was also shown to be superior to vemurafenib. So I think these, these sorts of combinations definitely do appear to have legs. And newer combinations are also being explored using um, RAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors that may in fact have slightly different profiles of activity. And one of these is on carafenib and vinimetinib. Um, I have one graph shown here which really just summarizes what I said um, about the data comparing dabrafenib and trametinib to vemurafenib. This is an overall survival curve that just sil simply illustrates that in the um, time frame of this particular analysis, um, the combination of uh, dabrafenib and trametinib was superior to the combination of vemurafenib alone. Um, and I think this, this story plays out for all of the agents that have been tested in combination that are BRAF and MEK inhibitors compared to um, BRAF inhibitors alone. So very encouraging. Um, now just to summarize this particular part of the presentation on targeted therapies, um, I have just want to reiterate, I just want to reiterate that BRAF and MEK inhibitors really do offer a truly personalized medicine strategy for patients with BRAF mutant melanoma. And the combination therapy approaches that have been tested to date do in fact appear to be superior to the single agent approaches. And this data is summarized by this review by Asierto and colleagues showing um, a variety of data from the two phase three studies of dabrafenib and trametinib and vemurafenib and cobimetinib, where you can see the overall response rate is quite good. And indeed, um, for dabrafenib and trametinib on the far right at the top, that the median overall survival uh, was, was quite good for that combination. And the data are um, maturing for the other agents that are coming along. But nevertheless, as I mentioned, um, resistance is, is uh, common. Um, and most patients who do get these BRAF and MEK inhibitors actually do appear to relapse. And what that means is that for the field, it's very important to be able to try to identify improved therapeutic approaches, one of which to consider is immunotherapy. And uh, researchers for a long period of time have been exploring immunotherapy as a means to improve mel melanoma outcomes even more. So now we'll uh, move on to the next part of the presentation. And I just want to give you a, a couple of slides by way of overview of the background on immunotherapy. So it's really been known for some time that, immuno, um, uh, that melanoma is one of the more immunoresponsive tumors. 
Um, some of that has revealed itself by way of tumors kind of resolving on their own for no obvious reason in a small fraction, a very small fraction of patients. William B. Coley at the turn of the century tried to harness this effect by using infections to target cancers, including melanoma. Um, in um, the late 1990s, uh, high-dose IL-2, a cytokine that stimulates the immune system, was approved by the FDA for the treatment of melanoma. And in 2011, uh, interferon alpha-2b was approved for the treatment of melanoma after successful surgery to resect the cancer. Uh, so both of these cytokines have been used to stimulate the immune system to take advantage of its uh, ability to mop up melanomas. However, both of these agents, and indeed including the approach that Dr. Coley took, um, are associated with significant dose-related toxicities uh, and a relatively low response rate. Um, so these observations both spurred the search for better approaches because, because there are hints of success, but there was really limited um, activity with acceptable toxicity. And um, the next two slides really just allow us to focus a bit on some of the more uh, contemporary approaches to immunotherapy that are being used today. I will spend most of my time during the rest of the presentation focusing on the right-hand part of this slide, talking about the monoclonal antibodies that are being used to disrupt these checkpoint sig signaling molecules that are illustrated here, CTLA-4, PD-1, and PDL one But I do want to say that there are other approaches that are being explored in the clinic that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on except in the future therapies section that are trying to take advantage of um, other immune cells beyond the T cells, which are, of course, central in the response against the tumor cells. Um, but I um, also will just mention that there are a number of vaccines that are being developed uh, which take advantage of the fact that um, peptides or other approaches can stimulate den dendritic cells, and these um, dendritic cells then go on to present uh, appropriate antigens to T cells for further activity. Uh, likewise, there's a lot of activity in the area of cellular immunotherapy where tumor cells, uh, excuse me, um, T cells or dendritic cells may be isolated from a patient and then manipulated outside of the body in a variety of ways readministered to the patient and, the, and all in the hopes that they've been enriched and activated to uh, essentially um, mop up the tumor cells and do away with them, taking advantage of the immune system. But as I said, I will focus mostly on checkpoint blockade, so-called checkpoint blockade, which um, is mainly built around uh, three approved agents right now. The first of these is the uh, anti-CTLA-4 antibody known as ipilimumab, whose trade name is Yervoy. Um, the anti-PD-1 drugs are the newest players um, um, in, this, um, in this area. They are um, pembrolizumab, also known as Keytruda, and nivolumab, um, whose trade name is Opdivo. And so what's the, the general mechanism of action for these agents? Um, tumor cells and other cells um, appear to upregulate signaling to the T cells that turns them off. And that signaling is mediated in part by PDL1. It also is um, accepted by the T cell or recognized by the T cell as a turn off signal through um, molecules on its cell surface called CTLA4 and PD1. And so the idea behind these antibodies is that they would come in, um, block the block the CTLA-4 or block the PD-1 signal and therefore turn down the deregulation, that's why it's checkpoint blockade, kind of a, kind of a double negative, to then reactivate the immune systems, in particular the T cells ability to uh, attack the tumor. So checkpoint blockade in, in summary has three main tools that are approved right now, ipilimumab targeting CTLA-4, pembrolizumab, and nivolumab, each targeting PD-1. What do we know about ipilimumab? So ipilimumab was the first of these agents to be approved. It was approved in 2011. Um, based on uh, a look at the long-term data, um, out to 10 years, really, so you see 120 months, the, that about 20% of patients 
treated with ivalimumab appear to experience uh, durable responses that are sustained for as long as 10 years. Um, it, the curve seems to start to flatten out around three years. And this is really exciting because these are, these are not just any patients. These are patients with advanced metastatic melanoma who had no other options, who otherwise had an extremely short um, lifespan ahead of them. And so this is really a, a market improvement in the landscape for melanoma treatment. Um, and, and demonstrated long-term survival starts to make people think about using the cure word, which is really exciting in oncology, especially in melanoma, for which there were no treatments of um, widespread usage and significant approved in many decades, really until um, ipilimumab and um, bemurafenib, the targeted therapy inhibitor, were approved in 2011. But um, that, you know, let me just bounce back for a second. You know, 20% of patients, one in five, I mean, it's great, but it's really not as good as we want things to be, of course. So a number of activities have been taken to try to improve on the circumstances for melanoma. melanoma. I, I have it here as improving on ipilimumab. It's really just improving for patients in general. Um, but I'm, I'm illustrating here the outcomes for patients treated with um, the first anti-PD-1 drug that was approved in the U.S., pembrolizumab, um, it has been studied on a couple of schedules, in every three-week schedule, as well as in every two-week schedule. Um, let me just first point out that as you, you look at these two schedules um, in comparison, there's really not a big difference between them. The every three-week schedule is the one that is FDA approved, and that's how um, pembrolizumab or pembro is administered. And in this particular study uh, in which the um, authors looked at overall survival, you can see that um, pembrolizumab as a single agent did in, in appear to offer uh, superior overall survival outcomes in patients uh, when used as a single agent. Um, similar data have been seen with nivolumab alone. Um, so um, that uh, seems to be just a, a feature of anti-PD-1 antibodies, which is really fantastic news for patients. Well, um, what about um, nivolumab alone or nivolumab and ipilimumab in combination, right? Because when we have useful tools in the oncology business, one of the uh, typical things to do is to provide um, studies of these agents in combination. And there's, there's good preclinical biology that suggests that um, the different activities of anti-PD-1 antibodies as compared to anti-CTLA-4 antibodies might well um, indicate a superior benefit by bringing the two together. So um, in a study that also that examined um, nivolumab as a single agent, that's the blue line, um, ipi and nevo, nivolumab and ipilimumab in combination, that's the orange line, but both compared to ipi in the same um, study, it did appear that um, certainly nevo was superior to ipi and that the combination of the two look to be at least as active as um, the individual agent um, nivolumab. The authors noted in the presentation of this data that this particular study was not powered to directly compare nevo and ipi together. I think while we are looking at progression-free survival here, not overall survival, we will need to wait to see how the data mature to see if indeed overall survival um, is comparable or better, or I guess potentially worse, just to explore all of the outcomes compared to the IPI overall survival data. But that will take some time to mature, and we're uh, greatly looking forward to seeing the outcome of those experiments. Um, this is a so-called swimmer's plot um, depicting the um, positive benefit of IPI and NEVO in combination, as well as some of the side effects that are observed. And it's a little bit of a complicated slide, but I do want to spend some time on it because it makes a couple of interesting points. So first of all, as you can see, um, grade three and four adverse events were observed in a, in a number of patients. Actually, about half of the patients experienced uh, one of these significant um, grade three, four adverse events as compared to ipilimumab, which was about 24%. And it's interesting, most people, um, I guess in the old days, back in 2011, thought um, ipi was pretty tough medicine. So now I think the field has a pretty good handle, certainly at the academic medical centers where there's significant experience with ipi, how to mitigate the side effects there. And I, as 
uh, as it gains experience, I imagine they will learn how to also more productively manage the significant side effects associated with the combination of IPI and NEVO. Um, but um, even though half of patients discontinued treatment due to um, uh, the side effects in the combination, I just want to point out in this swimmer's plot, so um, every uh, black arrow is a place where a patient would, had an ongoing response. So you can see there's a large number of ongoing responses, you know, out to almost a year in this particular study. Uh, and that many of those responses are sustained, for example, in this region, even after discontinuing therapy. Um, the responses, which kind of occur down here, um, occur early in this treatment and are sustained even after treatment discontinuation. So this is actually pretty remarkable, um, a pretty remarkable observation and I think um, bodes well for the activity of the combination, um, especially for people who n might not want to get um, a lot of um, pretty tough combination therapy. I, I think it's really, really very encouraging data. Another piece of, I guess I would say, both encouraging and perhaps cautionary data is illustrated by this case report that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that in a particular patient who had a large mass um, in the chest wall, you can see it here in the CT scan, you can see it here visibly in this picture looking up um, um, on her body, that she had this really large uh, metastatic melanoma tumor. Within six weeks of receiving the combination therapy, the tumor kind of cavitated, went away, and you can see the resolution of it here. So um, this is, again, a picture's always worth a thousand words, fantastic news for the power of these agents in combination, but also uh, was published as a case report by the authors as a cautionary tale because one can well imagine that if uh, such a resolution occurred in an important internal organ, there might be um, side effects that would need to be uh, managed quite aggressively in, in the case that such activity were observed. So uh, we're at, we've actually moved through the presentation at quite a good rate, and I want to just spend a few minutes on this particular slide um, to talk a little bit about what's, what's happening in the melanoma field right now by way of summary as it relates to treatments and to show yet another illustration of um, uh, active immunotherapy in melanoma. So um, really, the title of the presentation is reiterated here. Melanoma is a case study for both targeted therapy and immunotherapy in this disease. There have been a series of um, tremendous approvals for melanoma starting in 2011 with the approval of emurafenib and trametinib, which is active and approved in V600E melanoma. Uh, beginning in 2013, we saw the approval of um, dibrafenib and um, trametinib for um, BRAP V600E and trametinib for either V600E or V600K melanoma. The combination of dibrafenib and trametinib, the first combination therapy for melanoma, was approved in 2014 um, for um, the, the both targeted agents. So this particular um, point, the particular point I want to make here is that new diagnostic tests are required and used to treat melanoma patients in a very personalized way with these targeted therapy agents. In the realm of immunotherapy, we see that ipilimumab, um, the, an anti-CTLA-4 antibody, was approved in 2011. And the activity of ipilimumab um, in an early paper published in 2010 is illustrated at the right-hand part of the screen. So this particular patient, you can see, had a large um, series of melanoma metastases on the skin. Within a short period of time after getting ipilimumab, there was what appeared to be a worsening of disease. This is sometimes referred to as pseudoprogression. It is occasionally seen with immunotherapy. Um, fortunately, uh, the investigators were able to treat through this apparent progression um, on the immunotherapy. And now you can see in these lower panels that as time goes on, this individual's melanoma did resolve. So this is a, a little bit of an unheard of 
um, observation in oncology treatment, and it just illustrates the different kinds of responses that immunotherapies um, can elicit. The responses can be time delayed, um, and so there is a reason to think that patients with, with extremely aggressive disease may not be the ones to benefit um, as uh, rapidly as one would observe, though the combination uh, approaches seem to work fairly much more quickly than ipilimumab. So now coming back to the summary, the anti-PD-1 antibodies, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, were approved in 2014, with Pembro being the first anti-PD-1 antibody approved in the U.S. Um, Nevo was actually approved in Japan um, uh, earlier in 2014, and so was the first anti-PD-1 antibody approved anywhere in the world. And I'm extremely excited um, to be able to tell you today that the news was announced just this morning that the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab, uh, a regimen for the treatment of metastatic, metastatic melanoma, was approved by the FDA today. It is the first combination immunotherapy approval anywhere in the world. Um, it came for patients who have um, no mutations at position 600 in BRAF, so-called BRAF V600 wild type disease, but really um, hot breaking news and, and just goes to show how quickly this field is moving. Um, what I've summarized on the next slide for those of you who are curious about keeping track of things and also curious about what are the, um, a little, what's a little more of the biology behind these treatments is a summary of the melanoma approvals from bottom to top, from um, oldest to most recent, and also the indicator of um, how quickly the FDA dealt with them. I think what you can see is that the FDA has really done a great job to employ all of the tools available to it from uh, fast track approval, priority review, accelerated approval, and the latest tool in its toolbox, breakthrough therapy designation, to really work closely with the developers in a back and forth conversation to be able to bring um, agents through to patients in, in an extremely fast way. Pembro was, uh, Pembro was approved in September 2014, Nevo in December 2014, and here, uh, less than a year later, we have a combination approval for IPI and NEVO. I mean, really, really fantastic news for patients. Um, the different styles of antibodies and whether they're small molecules or combination therapies are summarized here. Um, it's, it's really a new era for melanoma patients um, with, with these agents uh, coming to the fore. So where does that leave us and uh, where are we going from here as a field? Um, this particular slide um, comes, to, comes to us courtesy of Michael Atkins, who provided this review at the 2015 ASCO meeting after the plenary session, which talked about some of the data on the anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4 combination. And what you can see on the bottom is that the, the field marches on, as I've mentioned before, from single agent to combination approvals with um, vemurafenib uh, as the first agent approved, and now data emerging showing that these agents are really superior in combination. Um, then in the initial approval of ipilimumab in 2011, that showing that it was superior to a vaccine, to where we are and indeed to where we find ourselves today with um, IPI and NEVO being approved um, based on the data that was submitted to the FDA in um, V600 wild type disease, disease. And I think this, out, this um, pending question of whether the combination is in fact superior to a single agent disease. And I think we all eagerly await seeing what the data look like uh, as the overall survival data matures. Um, and so this is really my last slide, um, just talking about um, from Dr. Atkins' perspective that PD-1 is probably the backbone therapy for melanoma treatment, and it acts in um, it acts in the tumor to really turn the brakes off on the immune system. You can see these little blue dots here illustrating the the T cells that have been in that invade the tumor and are a bit sparse but are probably turned off by the tumor. And so antibodies against PD-1, newer antibodies that are coming along targeting anti pdl targeting PD-L1 are aimed at making these T cells more effective in their microenvironment. 
But there are quite a lot of tumors, um, in particular in melanoma, but even in other cancers that have really physically excluded the T cells from the tumor. You kind of see a, um, a front of T cells that are, um, they almost look like there's some kind of barrier to them from entering the tumor. And this appears to be where um, agents that are like ipilimumab, the CTLA-4 targeting antibody, or potentially other ways to energize the immune system and bring those um, uh, T cells into the tumor, like immune activating antibodies or cytokines, toll receptor agonists, perhaps oncolytic viruses, which are also moving through the um, regulatory review paradigm, or maybe even the targeted therapies um, might actually stimulate further invasion of the T cells into the tumor. So I think this is the, the ability to modulate the activity of the immune system has really opened up a lot of opportunities for um, melanoma patients, but also for many cancer patients. And then finally, the last approach, which just gets a lot of enthusiasm because it does appear that for some patients, this really seems to work well in melanoma, is the opportunity to produce T cells, to generate T cells that have particular activities or are enriched for the, uh, their ability to attack the melanoma. Um, this could take place by either the development of therapeutic vaccines, not just the kinds of vaccines you're used to hearing about, perhaps that are used to prevent disease, but are actually used to treat the melanoma that is preexisting. There are, is a lot of work that is going on, um, especially in other fields um, in uh, the blood cancer area, in particular to use um, T, uh, T cell receptor engineered adoptive cell therapy, that's the TCR engineered adoptive cell therapy, or uh, chimeric antigen receptors, another way to engineer specificity into T cells as, as the way to approach um, producing a productive immune response against melanoma. And indeed, as I said, in other cancers, uh, the CD19 cars, for example, look particularly promising. And um, then uh, stereotactic radiation, as well as chemotherapy, appear to be uh, a potential way to enhance the immunotherapeutic response. But I do want to talk for just one moment before I wrap up about chemo um, in melanoma. There have been a large number of studies published recently that clearly demonstrate that immunotherapy is far superior to chemotherapy. And so chemotherapy in melanoma is really uh, relegated to um, really, I would say, desperate situations and not a treatment of choice for melanoma based on the positive data that we've seen in um, the clinical trials to date. Well, that takes me to the end of my presentation. Um, my contact information is shown here, and I do want to definitely point you to um, our website, which is shown at the bottom, curemelanoma.org, which has some information not only on our, our research activities, but also information on patients on these cutting edge treatments. Now that we have nine new therapies that have been produced, we'll be updating that information as of today. It's been a pleasure to present to you, and I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Any questions from those of you out there? I put a question out there maybe just to get conversation started. Have any of you been treated with either melanoma targeted therapy or immunotherapy? Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Louise, for that informative presentation. I'm just going to remind our audience how they can start their questions. They can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button, the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. In addition, I want to let our audience know that this presentation has been approved for continuing educational credits. If you want to obtain the credits, please click on the Get Your Free CME CE Credits button located in the lower left 
of your screen. This will take you to a page listing all of our speakers and presentations, and you can claim your certificate at that point. We do have one question. Um, with respect to metatastic melanoma and new immunotherapies, how was the frequency of mutations, valine blood, and S100 levels? Did any patients have sickle cell disease? So this is an interesting, this is an interesting question. Um, um, let me comment on two different aspects of it. The um, frequency of mutations observed in melanoma was really discovered based on the high throughput sequencing that's been enabled by a lot of the genomics technologies um, that have been used uh, for many years and in, in some ways actually kind of got a bad rap recently that it's not going to help anyone. In fact, that data is proving to be um, critical um, in our understanding and the ability to take advantage of what's going on in disease. Um, I must say, I don't know about the relationship between those levels and S100, um, nor do I know about any relationship to sickle cell disease. I guess I would say one thing, however, since sickle cell is more common in um, patients, uh, at least in the U.S., of African-American descent, and since melanoma is relatively uncommon there, my guess is that there's not a clear linkage, but I don't know that for a fact. That's a, that's a very interesting point. Um, there's another question that has come in. Um, any successes yet in using um, ADC, which I assume is meant as antibody drug conjugants against melanoma? Um, I think the answer there is that um, there are a number of mutations that are, um, excuse me, let me say this differently. There are a number of antigens that are present on melanoma that appear to be um, ones that one might take get a handle on. However, some of those are expressed somewhat widely throughout the body um, and in other tissues. And so I think the, the impetus has been to not move um, aggressively towards antibody drug conjugates but um, to actually focus on maybe the more broadly acting immune system um, to treat melanoma. Um, another question. Uh, another question. Great questions coming in from our audience. Our next question, how important is the kinase selectivity for small molecule inhibitors of melanoma targets? Yeah, so this is a this is an important question as well. The the kinase selectivity is an interesting question and one to uh, be sure to keep in mind in any activity that you're uh, undertaking to try to target a particular protein. For example, the inhibitor vemurafenib actually has a particular mode of inhibition of V600E melanoma that is a little bit different from the inhibitors of dabrafenib and trametinib. Now, these drugs in general are reasonably selective kinase inhibitors. Um, another drug that was originally thought to be a, uh, an inhibitor of RAF kinase was serafinib, and I was actually at Bayer at the time that serafinib was being developed. It is a BRAF inhibitor, but it does pick up, pick up a broad spectrum of other kinases in its, um, in its inhibitory profile. And I think what's believed now is that in general, the activity of that agent is probably mediated more strongly through um, inhibition of KDR, VEGFR2, but not so much through BRAF. So I think the, in the case of the approved drugs for um, BRAF, in particular dabrafenib and, and um, bemurafenib, as well as trametinib, the MEK inhibitor, I think the specificity of those molecules is reasonably good and um, we're in good shape on that front. Thank you for that answer. Our next question has come in from the audience. How, how is the cost of small molecules versus immunotherapy? Does it justify the superiority of the immunotherapy? So 
So the, uh, the cost question is an important one. It's an important one here in the US and it's an important one around the world. Um, I think what we're really looking at is a revolution in how we think about treating cancer. Um, in, indeed, if you're talking about um, patients who might be able to get a relatively short course of immunotherapy and then potentially have an enduring response, I think that the, um, the benefits of that may well play out as we see that data mature. Um, the relative cost of targeted therapy versus immunotherapy, since we know that, um, I, think they, I think it's a little bit of apples and oranges. We know that targeted therapy offers benefits for, for patients who have extensive disease that is really out of control. And it really offers them um, a chance to have some high quality uh, time ahead of them. And indeed, there are some patients who appear to have really long-term responses, although it's a small fraction, but really long-term responses with targeted therapy. I think as we will see with the immunotherapies, it may be that these immunotherapies kind of amount to a sort of, well, if we're lucky, let me put it this way. If we're lucky, they amount to a kind of molecular surgery that um, is able to elicit a long-term response. I think the cost question is one that's really um, critical around the world. Um, at the Melanoma Research Alliance, we are particularly interested in making sure that new treatments and new innovations are available for patients. And um, I think really focused on driving those innovations forward while letting those who are expert in the cost um, equation try to work out the thorny details of that particular um, challenge. Great. Our next question. Have you tried Aptamer as a RAS, BRAF inhibitor of graft mutant melanoma? So I haven't seen any data on the use of aptamers as inhibitors. I seem to recall there was some old work that was done, but I just haven't seen anything done uh, recently. You know, I must say there, the targeted therapies really do offer a lot of benefit. And so at um, the Melanoma Research Alliance, about 40% of our funding portfolio is invested in trying to drive uh, an understanding of how to improve on these therapies. So if, if um, the research shows that aptimbers offer some unique um, therapeutic benefit, especially in overcoming the resistance that develops, I would encourage um, all kinds of research down that pathway to be explored. Brenda, do you want to feel, um, take a look at those qu next questions? Yes, thank you, Louise. We do have one more question. Is the immune system activity in metastatic patients lower than normal naturally? This is, a, this is a really complex argument, and I think um, where there's a need for a lot of, um, a lot of research to take place. Um, you have to remember that the immune system is a particularly complicated beastie. Um, there are many different cells, some of which are involved in being the, the attackers, the warriors on the ground to, take, um, to kill cells that are foreign or to release agents like antibodies that can manage foreign antigens. There are also cells of the immune system that are involved in turning off an immune response so that um, one doesn't just become one great big um, lymph node. And I think um, what the research is starting to suggest is that in some cases, and, and you could even think of it as an overly healthy immune system, is actually a disadvantage because it's somehow turning off an anti-tumor immune response. Um, but I think in general, the, the more prevailing perception is that um, a less robust um, immune system may indeed lead to less robust anti-tumor immune, immune responses. 
Um, I, I guess I would just wrap all of that up by saying for, for patients, it's important to just take care of yourself and uh, try to um, live as healthy a lifestyle as possible without going to extreme lengths. Anything else for us, Brenda? Thank you, Louise. That is all the time that we have for questions yet. I just want to ask if you have any final comments, advice, or other information for our audience. I just want to say um, that it's really been a, a great pleasure to be able to present to you today. I hope you've found the uh, information very helpful. Um, I would say um, if any of you are patients or patient family members or caregivers, I would encourage you strongly to seek out the uh, input and advice of um, uh, melanoma nonprofits who are well connected in the field. Um, there's a lot of things that are moving very quickly in the melanoma business and uh, it's a little bit hard for the docs to keep up with it. Um, I think, um, I mean, unless you see melanomas every day, in which case it's a different story, of course. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, melanoma indeed really is proving to be a case study for other cancers. There are as many as 10 cancers that are being aggressively studied based on the timely results that are coming from work on uh, checkpoint blockade and biomarker work, which I didn't touch on at all, uh, that's being funded by ourselves and by others. So the work in melanoma is really floating all boats in real time to advance the field for cancer care across the board. Uh, it's an extremely exciting time in cancer, as I said, and um, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Louise, and I'd like to thank our audience for their time and attention as well. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April 2016, and you'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when that webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to any colleagues who might have missed today's live event. Thank you again for attending. We hope to see you next time. Goodbye.